We have an amazing show for you today. Uh, Sluice Telescope partners in Dubai, France, the Canary Islands, South Africa, Florida, Arizona, and Nevada are all eagerly awaiting for the tiny planet Mercury to start its journey across the face of our local star, the Sun. And while we watch the stunning live views that we've got, we'll have a brilliant lineup of expert guests joining us at the top of each hour. I'll move the telescope very slightly um, so it's better framed for you. And that to me looks like Mercury just taking the, yeah, there it is. So it's, it's just in the top right hand corner there. Uh, and it's just nibbling out. So can you see the black drop effect? We can, can't we? It's, it's, I know this is really difficult to see uh, because the planet is so small, but there it goes. It's, it's still joined. It still looks like the little black disc of Mercury is still joined to the sun's limb. And there it is, there is second contact, just when we see the sun reappear on the other side of Mercury, there is that tiny, tiny dot. Wow, the guys at the Gregor Solar Telescope, thank you so much for that feed. Uh, that's uh, the Institute of Astrophysics who are running that uh, with the operators of the Gregor Solar Telescope. Wow, that is a fabulous, fabulous live video feed coming in. And to be quite frank, Pierre Gassendi is one of those figures that this is the fun part of my job of being a blogger for the Vatican Observatory Foundation and working with Brother Guy with the Vatican Observatory um, is a bit of a new figure for me too. And basically, he was the first person to record the data of the transit of Mercury uh, across the sun. And it's significant because Gassendi, when we look at the whole Copernican revolution, uh, the observations of Galileo, the emerging physics of that time, the Enlightenment with Descartes, um, oftentimes that we can recall the, um, for lack of a better term, the, the, the negative aspects of what happened with Galileo and the church. And, but mm -hmm. there was also at that same time too, after this, a strong push to try to bring the church in step and what's this new emerging physics, um, how do we understand ourselves and how do we understand the faith in light of all of this? What he tried to do is he tried to marry empiricism and uh, ap specifically through the, the atomist, uh, atomism philosophies of Epicurus, tried to marry uh, a materialist worldview, um, an empiricist worldview, with Christian doctrine, which is a right. very ambitious project <laughs> to undertake. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Bob Berman here at SLU, back to talk to you about transits in general. So why isn't this an eclipse? We have Mercury passing in front of the sun. Isn't this a partial eclipse of the sun by Mercury? You bet it is. It really is. Nonetheless, when a planet, which always appears small compared to the size of the sun, crosses the face of the sun, we have a different name for that, and that's a transit. There's only two planets can, that can transit the sun because there are only two planets inside of our orbit, Mercury and Venus. Now, Mercury transits are the more common because Mercury is so fast in going around the sun, completes an orbit every 88 days. So like a moth going around a candle, it's just going whoosh, 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 whoosh. And so it's a lot more opportunities for it. The problem is that we don't see it happening every month because the Mercury orbit is tilted. If you just have our whole solar system and you shrink it in your mind to the size of a cookie, the next mm -hmm. star is two football fields away. Wow. But with the telescopes that we're building right now, uh, that we have built, and with the new ones coming up, and you were talking about these amazing telescopes that we're building, and that we will have also even bigger than the, the telescope you were talking about. We're talking about the 40 meter that we're building in Chile and yeah. so on. So we can yeah. actually spot small planets, not as small as Mercury, but small planets around stars that are cosmic football fields, if you want, away on the scale where we are as big as a cookie. And that but is what I, fascinates me and connects this transit in our own solar system to mm -hmm. other suns and how are we going to use that information 
the light that gets filtered through the atmosphere of the planet while it transits, while it blocks part of our view of the hot stellar surface, like Mercury does here, but Mercury has no yeah. atmosphere, so yeah. we can't really use that yeah. one. But it's the same principle. And then part of that light gets filtered through the atmosphere of the planet, and that allows us, over a light years away, to figure out if there's signatures of life on another world. And I think it's that is an amazing time in history. Presumably it wasn't possible until the invention of the telescope to actually view a transit. Were there any records before that? Well, uh, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. Until Galileo started using the telescope and Gassendi saw a transit in 1631, all people knew was that Mercury became invisible um, yeah. in, in, in the sky. It was so close to the sun, the sun was so bright, they just couldn't see it. So it disappeared. And I think that's one reason why in ancient myths, the, the planet developed a bit of a reputation as a trickster. You could be a oh, thief, okay. a pickpocket. In one such story, Hermes decided to play a trick on his brother Apollo, who drove the chariot of the sun across the skies each morning. Hermes was still just a baby, but despite his age, he was already incredibly smart. Once, he climbed out of the cradle and went on an adventure in northern Greece. Apollo had a herd of precious cattle in that area, and Hermes wanted to find them and steal them away. I, I knew what retrograde is. You know, I know what retrograde mm. is in terms of um, planetary motion, but I yeah. didn't realize that, that people thought it had such an effect on their personal lives. Um, mm. And so I just set out to say, hey, you know, this thing is happening. Whether or not you believe in astrology, and I'm not, I mean, I don't personally believe in astrology, but I wasn't looking to debunk that or anything necessarily. Um, so I found that, and it didn't take me very long to find it, because now with social media, you can find um, a lot of a lot of things out there. And it's almost kind of like a, it's it's not an echo chamber, but it might be kind of a positive feedback thing where, you know, you get a lot of people online talking about something like this, that Mercury retrograde is affecting their lives. People would say, you know, I'm not going to get out of bed today because Mercury is in retrograde and I think that it's going to negatively impact my life. And so it would be really, it's going to be better for everyone if I just stay in bed. So, you know, you look around and, and it's being blamed for uh, technology failures. And, and, you know, you and I know technology fails all the time. That's kind of an inherent part of technology, right? And so um, d it, did Twitter go down because Mercury was in retrograde or did Twitter go down because Twitter goes down once a week, right? So it's kind of, you know, you have to kind of look at the, look at the, uh, the uh, is Twitter going down every week or is it just happening in Mercury retrograde? And I, I'm not sure people are asking themselves this, um, but they're also, you know, they're, they're blaming the bus breakdowns. They're blaming um, bad communication you know maybe you're having a conversation with somebody and and you're just not quite uh talking yeah. on the same level you're kind of missing each other right and so that's yeah. that's they're they're like oh it's mercury retrograde you know it's it's not us it's mercury retrograde so so i said okay fine well i would like everyone to actually know what mercury retrograde is if they're going to be blaming all of the bad things in their life on it <laughs> you you haven't been afraid to kind of lay yourself open to the internet and, and show your emotions. And I, I think there's, there's probably too much of people hiding their emotions nowadays. We all seem to be on parade. And, and, and that, I think, squashes the, the natural reaction that so many of us have to events like this, but are almost too embarrassed to actually show other people the enthusiasm. Yes. Is that I what always you get? been someone who's been big and you know strong and fearless, and so and I live with no neighbors. You know, I the double rainbow video is my front yard. I I'm looking at that right now, and so I've always had this openness and this fearlessness. And so when I when I see something incredible in nature, I react to it in a pure form because I fear nothing and I'm not ashamed or embarrassed. You know, it's like and the other thing is there's no one here. You know, so I'm out here in the middle of this mountain and I have no neighbors and I can just be open and, and not have to worry about what people are going to think.
Well, that helps. But, you know, I, I think it was a really generous gesture, actually, of you releasing that video, because I think a lot of people wouldn't have done that. Uh, and I know, actually, when I was doing that solo eclipse and I had tears in my eyes and I could hardly speak, I don't know why, but I felt this sense of embarrassment. And you shouldn't feel that with such a, a natural emotion and uh, I mean part of that may have been that we didn't actually go to bed the previous night but you know it was an intensely emotional experience but there was still something in the back of me trying to take it in but also being oh I'm a little bit embarrassed that I'm showing this to other people yeah I lost my I don't have any embarrassment because if anyone wants to make fun of me I'll smack them <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching this on a small screen. I'm going to get this a bit bigger for me because I need to see this. There it is. There it is. It's still a circle, isn't it? It's still disconnected from the outside. There's the black drop effect. That's it. That is the black drop effect that you see only in transits of Mercury and Venus. You can see, look, it's joined it up. It's almost kind of, it looks like it sucked some of the planet out, but it's pulled some of the sun in. What a remarkable image there from the Arizona Prescott Observatory. Now, I can still see Mercury, can you? It's still there, still taking out a tiny, tiny little chunk of the sun's disk. Now, it's getting more difficult, diff it's still getting more difficult. I think it's just about there still. And this is the problem of timing astronomical events. Every person sees things slightly different now i think that's gone i think we've now no maybe not it's still a little chunk maybe taken out so now i think it's gone i think that is fourth contact but you can't go yet you got to stick around for a little while yet just for five minutes uh that was the end of well now i'm looking at it again and i'm thinking no maybe there is still another little chunk taken out of it but uh, i think we'll mark that down as Mercury has, uh, has left the building.